one of the things that I've become super, super, super aware of is how society has normalized fake food. People don't think twice about eating Doritos. It is fake food. I mean, maybe, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but maybe 10%, 20% of what's in there is actually real food. And we don't think twice. I mean, we people drink too much. They eat too much. They have sedentary lifestyles. They eat pancakes and syrup every morning because it's the American breakfast and they've normalized these lifestyle rituals. And then they wonder why they have a heart attack at 56 or why they have you know diabetes at, at 38. The average person would say, I, would, I wouldn't want to eat the way Doug eats. It's too boring. It's like, well, I think it's, it's boring to get sick and fat. I'd rather feel fantastic and look fantastic. Okay, good morning, everybody. We have uh, Doug uh, Brignoli. I'm, I'm going to probably butcher the name and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Let me unmute you real quick. So I'm going to just kind of have you unmute yourself. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. How do you say, what's the correct pronunciation so I don't sound like a knucklehead? Well, the common pronunciation would be Brignoli. And how do you say it? What's the right correct? What's the right way? Well, the, the, the original French pronunciation would be Brignol, Brignol or Brignol. Brignol. But Brignoli is the Americanized way. Got it. Well, I live with a French woman, so then I should I should know that, but I don't think I've seen that word. So where are you, where are you located, Doug? In California, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Okay. I, I actually got to go. I'm actually going there tonight. In fact, actually, awesome. I'll see you uh, here. Well, uh, yeah, we'll see where you're right now. I'm going to be down in, uh, in Orange County. So anyway, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, there's a number of people that wanted, you know, thought you'd be a great person to chat with. And I, and I certainly am looking forward to it. So just, I mean... You know, by looking at you, I can tell you're you're you've been doing a lot of uh, taking care of yourself, health wise, bodybuilding, all that stuff. But tell us a little bit about your background for people that aren't familiar with you. Uh, okay, I'm 62. Uh, I started working out at the age of 14. I started competing in bodybuilding at at 16. I competed and won Teenage California, Teenage America at 19, Mr. California at 22, Mr. America, and Mr. Universe at 26, and continued. I won Mr. Universe a second time at the age of 59. Wow. Three years ago. Um, I'm competing again next year in the Mr. Universe for a third time. Uh, and I'm the author of a book called The Physics of Resistance Exercise, which explains the biomechanics of resistance exercise. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on a, in a on a long career. You know, there's there's some people that, that that do that and they last for a few years and then they're done. But to, to maintain it over a lifetime certainly speaks to, uh, you know, knowing what you're doing, I suppose. Um, as far as you know, and I guess this is the thing. So I'm like you, I started lifting weights when I was 13, 14 years of age. I'm 55 now and I've been doing it. And I never was a bodybuilder, but I've always been an athlete. And of course, I valued weightlifting as, or, or strength training as part of that. I think that, that helps you protect you and makes you a better athlete. Um, but what, you know, I guess what got you interested in wanting to do bodybuilding in the first place? This is a 19, you know, I guess ni- early 1970s or something, I'm guessing, right? Right, 1975, 1974. I was just really skinny. I w- I've always been an ectomorph, and, and I wanted to get bigger. And um, in 1974, you know, weight training was not known as a weight builder. I mean, my thinking at the time was if I wanted to gain weight, I've got to eat a lot of junk food. <laughs> mm-hmm. And my, my junior high school coach said, no, 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 that's not the kind of weight you want to gain, even if you, your metabolism allows it. What you want to gain is muscle weight, and you need to do weight training for that. So I, I got a, a weight training set for the home. And then I was lucky enough because I was living in Pasadena, California, and I happened to be living five blocks away from Bill Pearl's gym. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace. He just passed away. Rest in day. peace. Yeah. He was my mentor. He was my father figure. Um, and I went there and I said, listen, I, I really want to work out here, and um, but I can't afford it. And so I'm wondering if you'll allow me to work for you in exchange for membership somehow. And he goes, yeah, come on in every weekend, every Saturday and help me do some janitorial work. I'll still pay you, but I'll let you, you know, have membership. And so then he became, you know, sort of my, my mentor and guided me. Uh, and I started competing at 16 years old. Interesting. And have you, well, I guess, you know, that's some people call that, that time frame the golden age of bodybuilding, you know, this, you know, there was different aesthetics as opposed to today where everybody just gets as huge as possible. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on how bodybuilding has either evolved or de-evolved, depending upon how you look at it. But, you know, you mentioned that and the research certainly shows this. I mean, you know, you're not going to put on muscle unless you do the strength training. I mean, that's, you know, that's that's just. And, and so, you, you know, back then, 
it's kind of common sense type of thing. But how did the nutrition? What was how was the nutrition back then versus now? Has it evolved anything, or, or did they had they already figured it out back in the seventies? Well, you know, back then, um, Albert Beckles and mm-hmm. all those guys were just doing chicken and rice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and sometimes you'd hear about, you know, um, some people doing meat and water diets. Um, but more often than not, it was, it was low carb diets or low fat diets, one or the other. And, um, I remember buying a book. You probably remember the book called eat to win Robert Haas, Mm -hmm. uh, which of course is really outdated now. I mean, he talked about simple and complex carbohydrates, which of course are terms you don't even use now, because now we talk about glycemic rating and things like that. But, um, you know, as well as I could sort of figure out, I was better off eating complex carbs rather than simple carbs because complex carbs break down more slowly, quote unquote, and simple carbs. That's actually not true, right? You can get a simple carb that breaks down slowly and you can get a complex carb that breaks down quickly. And nobody was talking about insulin back then or anything else. So um, I would say that um, most of us who got shredded and I was pretty shredded when I won the Mr. California sort of did it because, you know, um, in other words, it wasn't the most efficient way, but there was enough calorie deficit to get you lean. And so I just used as really zero zeros. I was so paranoid of eating fat that I wouldn't even take vitamin E capsules. (laughs) So um, zero, zero, zero fat, and also obviously low calorie. Um, And then throughout the years, you know, you heard more and more about, you know, uh, the different options. keto and things like that, what what happened for me uh, somewhat recently was um, I needed to have back surgery. I'd, I'd herniated a disc, not severely, but you know enough that I needed to have it repaired. And they, they want you to do a pre-op. And so they found that I had you know high cholesterol, 290. I, and interesting because it's the same diet I had been using all along, which was the American Heart Association food pyramid diet. I was eating, you know, carbs, starches, pasta, bread, rice, potatoes, and a very, very, very small amount of dietary fat. And all of a sudden now I've got high cholesterol and high LDL, low HDL. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting because cardiovascular doctors so often don't know how to eat right. And so they're saying to me, make sure you eat low fat. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, there's something wrong with this because that's what I've been doing. So I, I don't know if you know Jeff Feliciano, but he was, he's sort of like the Dan Duchesne of the 70s. Okay. Um, and he said, well, the reason why your numbers are crazy is because you've probably been following the American Heart Association diet. I said, yeah. He goes, stop that. He says, jack up your fats, kind of cut out your carbs, cut out your starches. I want 40% of your dietary calories coming from fat. 30 from protein, 30 from low glycemic carbs. Do that for a few months and see what happens. And sure enough, after a few months, my cholesterol had gone from 290 to to, to, uh, 138. Wow. Proving that we make our cholesterol. We don't eat our cholesterol. (laughs) Yeah, uh, yeah, that's not, I mean, we we, we know that the liver makes approximately 80% of our cholesterol and maybe more or less depending upon what we're eating, but sure. So, um, you know, you, so you'd been on the, on the, on a low fat diet for decades, I guess. Is that, is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah. And yeah. Decades until, you know, my fifties when my metabolism started to not allow it. <laughs> In other words, I could get allow, I could get away with the mistakes because my system was healthy enough to, you know, adjust and fix it. But that isn't the right way to eat. Well, and, you, you know, and, and some, and many people would say, well, you know, because you're you know, obviously working out hard. If you, if you do a competitive body, then you're training a lot, you're training hard, you're very, you're, you, you know, you maintain a good body composition. You're probably by definition fairly insulin sensitive. And so that may allow you that leeway to, to, to eat yeah. that way. But then it eventually at some point catches up. I think it caught up with me in my, my uh, early forties when I noticed that, Hey, this is not the right way for me. And then I had to start changing my diet pretty, pretty uh, profoundly. Cause I was, I was walking around at 280, 290 pounds for 20 years you know, I'm six foot five, so I'm a pretty big guy. And I was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And so I, you know, like, you know, went through all kinds of different dietary shifts and came on to a, obviously a very low carbohydrate approach as I do now. Um, as far as, you know, and this is the thing, cause you're, you're, you know, you said you're in your early sixties and you look great and you're obviously still functioning. I think compared to 99.99% of 60 plus year olds, you would be in that top category, just 
you know, on just body composition alone, I'm probably on function. Um, a lot of people are critical of, you know, they'll say that, you know, just because, you know, lifting weights is bad for you. Bodybuilding is bad for you. Being lean is, is not beneficial. You know, they, they, they kind of have this sort of belief that, um, there's bodybuilders are dropping dead all the time. And some of that happens, you know, we see some of these guys draw dying early, but I think there's some confounding factors there. Some of it may be heavy drug use and maybe some of the other things that are going on and just the lifestyle in general. But how do you, I mean, are you concerned about your, you know, making it to 80? Are you thinking, Hey, I'm not going to, I'm because of bodybuilding, it's shortened my lifespan. Um, well, let me first start off by saying that um, for those of you that haven't seen me before, I'm usually not this drawn. I'm very drawn right now. I'm depleted because my my exhibition that I'm preparing for is in four weeks. Um, and for those that don't know how getting lean for a contest works, you have to go into the drawn state and then you bring yourself back up about a week before and then you sort of fill out and um, can I show you my abs? Sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Very impressive there. Very good. Nice job. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me that. Um, and, and so it is, I would agree that it's not the healthiest to stay this lean. Um, I think the healthiest way to be is, is, is what your genetics allows you to be when you're eating your 40, 30, 30, frankly, <laughs> that's just my opinion. Um, but it's only for a four month period of time. And then you go back to your routine and everything is fine. Um, does bodybuilding shorten my lifespan? You know, I suppose you could say that, um, certain aspects of bodybuilding, um, probably compromise health. Um, you know, I, I don't take a lot of steroids. If I take any at all, I only try to keep my testosterone level in the normal range. So I'll do, you know, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, if my thyroid level drops below normal, I'll bring that back up again. Basically, I'm looking at my blood tests and the effects of a diet, um, of a calorie restricted diet, force your body into kind of a preservation mode. And so it's trying to lose muscle. So it's pushing down your testosterone level. It's pushing down your thyroid level. It's trying to get you to be less expensive with your fuel consumption. Um, and so um, I don't think that's unhealthy. I, I would say it's probably unhealthy to allow it to stay too low. Um, and so I do watch my health. I don't do things that other bodybuilders do. I don't take insulin. I don't do crazy, you know, uh, uh, diuretics. And I don't do stuff like that. I, I've never liked the idea of it. But will what I've done so far make me live to, let's say, 80 instead of 100? Uh, I don't know. Bill Pearl lived till 91, uh, and which is a pretty full life. Um, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that he took anabolics. Um, you know, there's a lot of other bodybuilders that are living into old age and took anabolics. So I don't think the anabolics, at least the rational use of antibiotics, if there's, if you can say that, um, compromises lifespan. I think it's the other stuff, the adrenaline, the diuretics, the other things that, that people are, are probably doing today. I've always liked the Frank Zane look. I haven't had much of a choice because I'm an ectomorphin. And so thank goodness I was not induced into trying to become a mass monster. But in short, I would just simply say that um, if I had to live a shorter lifespan, if I had to die at 80 instead of 100, um, but the quality of life was better, I would I would take that option. Yeah, I think most people, particularly when you look at, you know, does an extra 10 years living, you know, in, in a really sort of com compromised state, is it worth it? And I think most people say, and I think Frank's, yeah. Frank, Frank Zane's still out there lifting and he's, I think he's now 80 or something like that. He's, he's somewhere, yeah. that, somewhere in that age range. Yeah. So, yeah, he's been... Uh, always been a sort of a classic, you know, guy that you, like you said, he wasn't a giant guy, but very aesthetically, right. uh, yeah. uh, put together pretty well. Um, what, a, you know, as far as, you know, and again, most of the, this audience is not, are not bodybuilders never will be, and probably never has any aspirations to do that. But what are some common things for people to, to sort of focus on? Um, I constantly preach the importance of resistance training as a, as a very important part. But do you think there's anything that people, particularly as they age, it becomes important to them to, to make sure they're they're taken care of. Let me again just say that my book, The Physics of Resistance Exercise, um, 
encourages resistance exercise at, at any age, at every age, and for any objective. Now, you earlier used the, the term strength training, so I, I kind of want to explain how I interpret mm -hmm. strength training. A muscle can get stronger when it's challenged. So that is strength training. You challenge a muscle against resistance, and then it gets stronger. The myth that has existed for the last century, really, is that the heavier the weight you lift, the stronger you get. And the reason I say it's a myth is it's, it's, it's true that if you curl, let's say, 40 pounds versus 30 pounds, and that's heavier weight, that you'll get more strength with 40 pounds and 30 pounds. That's true. But if you squat, let's say, 400 pounds, and then you analyze the physics of the load of each of the contributing muscles, the quadriceps, the glutes, the erector spinae, you can identify the exact amount of load that each of those muscles is getting. And then you can ask the simple question, what if I challenged each of those muscles separately? Can I get the same amount of muscle load? And the answer is not only yes, you can get the same or greater amounts of muscle load without the skeletal strain, but you can actually do it better because there are some things um, that are neurological that are conflicts of interest. So for example, it's been well established by you know PhDs now in, in studies. If you do a compound leg movement, which involves your glutes and your quads, the glute activation, which is hip extension, deactivates hip flexion because they're opposing muscles. One of your hip flexors is one part of your quadricep. So your rectus femoris, which is a significant portion of your quadricep, is actually deactivated precisely when you're trying to activate it. So if you were to do a leg extension or a sissy squad, you would get no deactivation. And, and this is, I'm just going to throw these numbers out just so people have a grasp. If you're a 200 pound guy with a 200 pound bar on your back and you descend into a standard squat, that 30 degree angle of your lower leg will load your quadriceps with about 950 pounds of resistance. But if you were to do a sissy squat with no weight, same 200 pound guy, just lean back until your lower leg gets horizontal, you'll load each of your quadriceps with 1,200 pounds and nothing on your spine. So you can get more muscle load with less weight and less skeletal abuse if you understand the physics behind resistance exercise. Yeah, and, and I guess, I don't know if you're a fan or what your thoughts are. It's like Arthur Jones, obviously he was, you know, with, with the Nautilus system, you know, you're doing these very, you're able to isolate these muscle groups in ways that, you know, would, would perhaps support that. Is that, there's a, you know, there's Doug McGuff is, Probably some called body by science, which talks quite a bit about that. There's a lot of fans, you know, Mike Mentzer, Arthur Jones, all the Dorian Yates guys that are kind of fans of this hit style stuff, and they often talk about doing stuff that way. Is that is that something you subscribe to, or, or? Yeah, let me let me first just say one thing. When a muscle is working, it doesn't know if other muscles are working at the same time. So the notion that isolation exercises are not as good as compound exercises is, is ridiculous on its face because Muscle doesn't know, doesn't benefit from a simultaneous participation of another muscle somewhere else. All it knows is it has a job to do. Is it doing it well? Is it early phase loaded? Is it full range of motion? Is it working to maximum capacity, et cetera? Um, HIT has nothing to do with isolation. HIT has to do with intensity. HIT has to do with, you know, um, is it better to do one set or two sets that are all out versus 10 sets that are 80 or 90% effort. Um, and I think that even um, Ellington Darden has now come out and said, we were wrong about that. They've done studies now that have shown that if you take a set to absolute failure, that it's less beneficial than if you work at 90, 95% maximum effort, because up until that point, you have a lot of metabolites, which are the burning and the fatigue and the lactic acid. And then once you get to failure, then you start producing a high degree of calcium ions, which ions, which um, actually damages the muscle, forcing you to take a longer period of time before your next workout, which now screws up your frequency thing, because it's best to work a muscle once every three or four days when it's at the peak of the supercompensation phase, and then it starts to come back down. So if you work the muscle so hard, that you've got to rest five, six days before you can work it again, you've missed that peak. And the result of that is that you will get muscle, but you may only get 
40% as much as you would have gotten had you done less more frequently. Yeah, it's, you know, there, I, I saw a nice review, I think Brad Schoenfield and some of the others, you know, these you know, scientists that study this stuff talking about, you know, optimal frequency, you know, maybe something like 10 sets per week per body part as a minimum, and, and maybe advanced lifters need more frequency and more volume. Um, and that sort of seems to support that. And um, yeah, you know, the, the whether you take it to 90% or 100%, the 100% doesn't seem to provide any additional benefit. And you're saying it's, it's perhaps even detrimental, which is kind of- It's, it's kind of productive. What's interesting about what you just said, you said 10 sets per week. I think that is a real misleading recommendation. And the reason I say that is because let's just say you've got to take Lipitor for whatever reason. And the doctor gives you the prescription and or on the bottle, it says, let's say, you know, 70 milligrams a week. He wouldn't say that. He would say 10 milligrams a day, right? And there's a big difference. Yeah, if I sure. take 70 milligrams on Sunday, it's going to really screw me up as, a, as opposed to the frequency. So um, I do three sets, three to five sets per muscle twice per week. That is not the same thing as six to 10 sets a week. Um, it is specific. It is three sets at a time. It's a dose. Right. More than that, they've shown charts. They've shown charts when after three sets, four sets, five sets, it starts to level off. After four sets, five sets, you are not getting the same benefit you were getting at one and two sets. There's a diminishing return. So the idea that you can just say 10 sets a week, well, then I'll just work out once a week and do 10 sets. Right. Those aren't interchangeable. Yeah, I think I think in part, yeah, and I agree with that. And I think part of the uh, issue is, you know, it's, it's how much total volume do you need in a week? And, and it's impractical for most people to do 10 sets in one setting, you know, you know, unless you've got some really screwed up schedule and you can only work out once a week, then you, then you do what you have to do. But I mean, ideally. And so, um, what are your thoughts on training frequency as far as what you do now in your sixties? I mean, are you training six days a week, seven days a week, or where do you, where do you, where do you, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, I'm training seven days a week now because of this event, but let me tell you a brief story, which will sort of explain how drastically bad or how drastically good it can be. Um, I had bought into the belief that volume mattered. That more volume equals more muscle. So I had gotten to the point where I was doing 10 to 12 sets per muscle group each work. And now you realize we've got about eight, we've got 18 to 20 muscle groups, depending on which ones you prioritize. So if you were to do, let's say 10 sets for 18 muscle groups, you have 180 sets to do. Now, the question is, how long can you do those? Now, um, I was taking basically five days to get my 180 sets. That means that on the sixth day, I either start over again or I take a rest and then I start over again on the seventh day. And so I was doing a five-way split. And um, about a year ago, I had become frustrated and I assumed it was because of my age. I was not getting the muscle that I used to be able to get or keep. And so I thought, screw it. I'm just going to prioritize health now. I'm just going to do a three day a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two sets per muscle group. And on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'll do cardio. And I switched to that and I started to grow significantly. And I thought, this is bizarre. I'm going from 10 sets to two sets and I'm growing. So I started doing some research. I found an article by Chris Beardsley and he explained that there's three things a muscle needs to recover from during a workout. And they come at different stages, but the most often you can work a muscle is every other day. That may not be ideal for reaching that peak compensation, but certainly three days, uh, the third day would be the, the ideal frequency. So I started playing around with it and I can't even tell you how dramatically the difference was. I am growing so much more than I was growing doing 10 sets. And if anybody would have told me in the 80s when I was competing, no, 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 you don't have to do so many sets, just do three or four um, and then move on. I would have thought, no, 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 that's impossible. A muscle can't possibly grow on three or four sets. And turns out it grows far, far, far better. Now, let's do a, a simple amount of math. If you're going to do, let's say, uh, a frequency of twice a week, that means you've got to work the whole body in three days. If you're trying to do a, a, a 90 minute workout, an hour and a half workout each time, that means you've got 90 minutes to do six muscle groups. You can't do 10 sets or even six sets 
for ten mu- for for six muscle groups in an hour and a half. So if you do the math, you do three six sets on one day, six on the next, six on the next. You're eighteen muscle groups, and it it demands a frequency of twice a week. Let me ask because you mentioned about the time factor there. So I mean, is there a and I guess it's going to depend on you know if you're doing squats versus you know calf raises or something like that because of the, the recovery time, but. Any thoughts on recovery time between sets? I mean, some people, you know, they, they just kind of, you see some of the CrossFit athletes and they're just running through stuff. And obviously their goals are different than, than yours would be as a bodybuilder. But it's from, and again, I, I like to keep, you know, when we talk about this, we talk about what the goal is. And, the, and your goal is bodybuilding, muscle hypertrophy, aesthetics, where somebody else's goal might be, I want to run faster or throw farther or something like that. So there's a different approach. But when we, when we talk about bodybuilding, recovery between sets how important is that and is there a number that you like to see or you think the literature supports well they've done studies and they've actually (laughs) proven that a longer rest time between sets is better than a shorter rest time between sets this is obviously counterintuitive i mean we were all trying to go for the burn make the rest time as short as possible sometimes trying to keep 30 seconds between sets right well obviously Mm -hmm. when you do that you have a mounting level of fatigue well, that mounting level of fatigue actually compromises the quality and productivity of that next set. So they, they, there's a chart. You can easily Google this. Just look ideal frequency, excuse me, ideal rest time between sets. There's one study that showed like 150% better muscle growth resting five minutes between sets versus resting one minute between sets. So what I do um, when I structure my workout is I typically alternate with opposing muscle groups or an unrelated muscle group. So I'll do pecs and lats. So by the time I finish my lats and come back to pecs, it's been about three minutes. And that's about the rest of the perfect amount of rest time for the pecs to recover enough for their next set to be uncompromised. Um, you mentioned squats. Squats is a whole different ball game. And the reason it's a different ball game is because you're not talking about muscle fatigue recovery. You're talking about systemic recovery, mm-hmm. right? Squats uh, it has causes a lot of systemic fatigue, um, and we used to think that that was good. In fact, you, I'm sure you've heard that to, that that squats increases testosterone level and growth hormone level, and it's because of the systemic fatigue. But the fact is, and it's very misleading, if you make your body go into what would be considered an energy crisis, systemic fatigue, there is a certain amount of catabolism associated with that. Your body is producing cortisol. And to offset the cortisol, your body produces a small amount of testosterone and growth hormone, but it basically levels it out. And then the studies now that have shown that that is not sustained. It's not long lasting. It does not result in an anabolic effect. So the bottom line is you're not going to get um, any better muscle growth from a, from a squat. In fact, you could compromise it um, as compared to just doing your glutes separately and your quads separately and getting much less systemic fatigue. Yeah, I think the study showing that exercise induced testosterone elevation doesn't, in fact, contribute much to to muscle growth. Right. It's, it's more what you're exposed to throughout the day over a 24 hour period. And, and no one asks, why is that happening? Well, it's happening because of the catabolic response, yeah. which basically just evens it out. Interesting. W- w- you know, as far as, you know, when you talk about uh, isolating, is there no benefit in any way for doing compound movements then in your mind is there any reason to do squats and deadlifts and bench press and all those things which are you know overhead press which have been the, they've been a staple of bodybuilding and powerlifting and weightlifting for gosh a century now i i have to almost apologize because i, I realize that some of those lifts are basically holy grails uh and so it's somewhat sacrilegious to say that you know there's no benefit to let's say a deadlift but I will say it, there's no benefit to a deadlift. Um, no benefit, I shouldn't say no benefit. What I should say is no greater benefit than would occur if you isolated those muscles that are participating separately. Um, and there's an, an enormous amount of, of orthopedic risk. Um, so one of the things that I explain in my book is that anytime you're watching somebody lift in the, in, in the gym and you're, you're looking at his limbs, whenever the limb is horizontal, perpendicular to gravity, the muscle that's operating that limb is the most loaded. So when you're doing a deadlift, your torso gets horizontal. The muscles that are operating that limb are the most loaded. That would be, of course, the glutes and the erector spinae. The glutes are far stronger than the erector spinae. 
right? So that's why what we see sometimes is you'll see a guy doing deadlifts with perfect form. He's adding weight, adding weight, adding weight. There comes a point where he can't keep his spine arched anymore. Spine are failing before the glutes are. They have less strength capacity. So if you do a perfect form deadlift with, you know, out rounding your spine, you will, let's say, max out your erector spinae, isometrically, by the way, because you're not moving those muscles dynamically, but you're underloading the glutes. Because once you get to the point where you're actually maximally loading the glutes, you've exceeded the capacity of the erector spinae. That means that a deadlift is not a good glute exercise. You'd be better off doing a multi-hip machine and doing one glute at a time, left, right, or right. You can load it more without anything on your spine, which does not mean that you shouldn't do anything that involves your spine. It just means that choosing wisely what not to overdo and what to do you know, in, in, in a more rational manner is the better approach. So what about the, you know, there's a lot of people that maybe don't have access to a multi-hip machine and some of the, some of the things that would best isolate, you know, maybe you could do, you know, a hip thrust or something like that, I suppose. But how does, how does that person go about, you know, designing something? Let's say they're working out at home in their garage and they got a barbell and, you know, maybe a few pieces of equipment. How, how can they do all this stuff? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, let me just say that the, the, the fact that not every gym has a multi-hip machine is fascinating because the concept of loading the end of the lever, the limb that's being operated by your target muscle is basic. That's what you do when you do a leg extension. That's what you do when you do a leg curl. That's what you do when you do a side raise, a curl. A tr- You're loading the end of the limb that's being operated by your target muscle. So for whatever reason, gyms have thought that multi-hip machines are not basic enough. Uh, and so that's unfortunate. Um, by far, the multi-hip machine is the best glute exercise you can possibly do. The second best, third best, fourth best is distant second, third, fourth. You can do glute bridges. You can do back lunges. You can do, you know, moderate weight deadlifts. Um, there's, a, there's a number of hip extension exercises you can do. Um, you can even attach, you know, a, a strap to the end of your femur with a cable and then do a hip extension with a cable resistance. Um, There's lots of ways to do it, and all of them will give you a better glute stimulation without the spinal risk that you would get by doing a heavy deadlift. Yeah, I'm just trying to think the last time I even saw a multi-hip, and it's been many, many years, you know, most gyms just don't, for whatever reason, don't care them anymore. And and I agree, it's kind of one of those things which they they did have a high level of. By the way, I work out in a garage. I work out in a garage gym. Okay. And I have a, a multi-hip machine. Yeah. I only have two machines. This is what's interesting is people would think you can't get a, a world-class physique working out in a garage gym. I have a, du- a dual cable machine, double adjustable, mm-hmm. and I have a multi-hip machine. I have an adjustable decline bench. I have a couple of seats and benches and some dumbbells. And no, none of my muscle groups are compromised. You can do it. But I would say that a multi-hip machine is more valuable, more Mm, let's just say um, um, irreplaceable, maybe than a, even a leg extension or leg. You can do hamstrings with cables. You can do quads really well with sissy squats. And some of you that have seen me lately, I, I've, I've been doing this, uh, what I call a pendulum sissy squat. I put a hip harness around me and I attach a rope to it. And, and basically I lean back and I can do a full knee bend uh, sissy squat pendulum style and I can put a weighted vest on and my quads are blowing up. In fact, my quads are, are better than they were when I was competing, you know, with a full gym. Um, and so um, there's ways to work the quads and the hamstrings without a, without a full gym, but a multi-hip machine, if you're going to invest in something for the home, it's worth doing because the glute is pretty important. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. Cause I'm thinking about my home gym and what, things I could add or, you know, what I don't need in there. But let me ask you about, um, cardio, you know, I mean, are you a guy that walks on the treadmill at five o'clock in the morning or is, is it hit style stuff? What do you, does it even matter? Do you need to do any cardio? What are your thoughts on that? I, I would say that there's undeniable cardiovascular advantages to doing exercises that elevate your heart rate and sustain it there. Now you can do interval training where you run for a minute and walk for a minute, run for a minute, walk for a minute. Um, or you can do sustained, but there's no denying that there's 
huge benefits to the HDL, LDL, VLDL cholesterol levels um, by way of uh, elevating your heart rate on a regular basis. But it is not necessary for getting lean. You can get just as lean without doing any cardio exercise, provided you're doing enough calorie spending, and providing your calorie spending is exceeding your calorie intake. Um, I've gotten leaner not doing cardio than doing cardio, and that's because as an ectomorph, my body adapts too well to endurance exercise, and the metabolic rate starts to adjust, and pretty soon I'm burning fewer and fewer calories per minute than I used to at that same intensity level. And so it starts to preserve. It's almost like if it was your car and, it, and your car knew it had a long way to go, but it didn't have enough gas, it would start increasing its mileage, its gas mileage, right? It's fuel efficiency, right? You don't want to be fuel efficient. You want to be fuel inefficient. So from a fat loss standpoint, you don't need cardio. But yes, I do think that if you have the time and you care about your cardiovascular health, then it's good to do at least three to five days a week of cardiovascular exercise. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, the benefits of elevating your heart rate and certainly weightlifting can do that depending on, again, if you're doing a, you know, a 20 rep set of squats, you, you know, your heart rate may be 170, 180 yeah. when you do that. And I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could, I guess with the sissy squats, you could probably do when you work in the big muscle groups, particularly the legs, I assume yeah. your heart rate is elevated during that stuff. I'm, I'm wiped out after a set of, of pendulum sissy squats. I, I literally have to sit for three to four minutes before I can do my next set. I'm really, really, really winded. And you can feel my heart pounding. Why? That's just because the quad is a very, very big muscle and it's requiring a lot of circulation and a lot of oxygen. And so, yes, the bigger the muscle and the more muscles that are participating, obviously, the more the oxygen demand and the more the cardiovascular demand. But um, when even when I'm alternating, if I'm doing pecs and lats and pecs and lats, you know, that's increasing my heart rate and increasing my respiratory rate. Not as much as it would if I was, let's say, walking fast up a hill. Um, and so there's still an advantage to doing, and I do this occasionally. There's a, a nice hill that I like here, and I'll go up and down this hill five, six times. It takes me about half an hour. And it gives me a, a feeling that I do not get with resistance exercise in terms of cardiovascular. Yeah, I do so. I throw a weighted vest on and walk. I've got a little mile walk that I do and up the hill, yeah. and I do that fairly frequently. But let me ask you about, because you'd mentioned, you know, uh, a few years ago, you're saying, you know, because I, I was, the volume was high um, and I wasn't making the gains. Are you less compared, like compared to where you are, you're 60, 62 now, like compared when you were 25 or when you were at the peak of your Mr. Universe, how much difference in lean muscle mass have, you know, what did you weigh back then? What do you weigh right now when you step on stage? How much have you lost any? Have you made, been able to maintain it? Where are you at on, with regard to that? When, when I won Mr. California, I weighed 184. I'm five foot 10. At, at competition when you stepped on stage. At, right on stage, 184 pounds. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what bodybuilders have this mentality of, of mass, right? So they tend to look at the scale and they tend to really care about what that scale says. And the heavier, the better. Uh, I mean, I, we've all seen bodybuilders bragging about how they're 235, you know, at you know, five foot eight or something, right? So, um, I, I, in fact, I suspect sometimes that's not even true. I suspect that sometimes they embellish because, you know, they want to impress people and people are impressed, unfortunately, with a high number, with a high weight, body weight. Um, I weigh 184.5 right now. <laughs> um, and I'm 30 days out from my competition. So I would guess that I will probably come down to maybe 181 or 82. And then I'll, I'll start loading up the week before, and I'll probably come up to 186, 187. So I'm still the same height, right? So I'm carrying the same amount of muscle mass theoretically by that. Um, and, and, and it, you know, I, I, I admit that I had fallen victim to that fear that you don't want to go below 200 pounds. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you stand on stage or when you walk down the street, nobody puts a scale under you. They look at you and they decide whether they like what they see. Right. So um, I think most of us realize that we've been bigger and looked smaller and we've been lighter and looked bigger. So there really isn't a direct correlation, um, at least not an exact correlation with body weight and looking big. I'd, I'd rather be ripped. Um, with a good amount of muscle mass and lighter than heavier, but not ripped. 
Well, I mean, I think that's really interesting because you can maintain essentially the same stage weight, you know, at, at your leanest level and, and, and basically the same amount of lean mass or, or arguably yeah. very, very close, even though you're, you know, 40 some years older, which, yeah. you know, most of us are, are under the impression that every decade we're going to lose, you know, 3% of our muscle mass or something, some, some number. I mean, it, it varies depending on who you talk to. And, and so... Uh, that's a testament to obviously doing the right thing over time and seeing what you can do. Because as, as you are well aware, the average 60-year-old is in horrible shape. I mean, most of them are on multiple medications. They're obese. They're frail. They're, they've are they got a poor quality of life. And, and you know, I, like I said, there's just such a contrast in what is possible, uh, you know, with that, with that sort of, you know, sort of the right lifestyle, I suppose. Um, yeah. when you, let me ask you about this because, you know, you, you said you're on this high carb, you know, maximum maximizing carbohydrates, obviously protein is an important part for bodybuilding. And then you switch to not, to, not now back then, right back then. Right. I'm saying that, but, but yeah, I'm yeah. saying it's like, you know, we, cause a lot of people, we, we, we talk about this thing called anabolic resistance, where as we get older, we just, we just can't put on muscle and we become sarcopenic and we, you know, in the worst thing we see sarcopenic obesity, obesity, where people are both fat and have no muscle mass. Um, so do you think that the diet has a role in that perhaps? Well, most certainly. I mean, it's, you know, most of us that are interested, concerned about our health, you know, we look at people's grocery carts at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes, you know, very surreptitiously, I'll take a photograph of their groceries on the thing and then my groceries on the thing right so um on the conveyor belt so um one of the things that i've become super 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 aware of is how society has normalized fake food people don't think twice about eating doritos yeah. it is fake food i mean maybe i don't know what the actual percentage is but maybe 10 percent, 20 percent of what's in there is actually real food and we don't think twice. I mean, we people drink too much. They eat too much. They have sedentary lifestyles. They eat pancakes and syrup every morning, you know, because it's the American breakfast and they've normalized this, these, you know, lifestyle rituals. And then they wonder why they have a heart attack at 56 or why they have, you know, diabetes at, at 38. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. Look, my, my, lifestyle um, in, in some countries would be considered luxurious. The average person would say, I, would, I wouldn't want to eat the way Doug eats. It's too boring. It's like, well, I think it's, it's boring to get sick and fat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd rather feel fantastic and look fantastic. And by the way, I enjoy the taste of my food. I really do. It's not, I think what happens is, you know, we've been lulled into this thinking that we've got to you know, prioritize gourmet. We've got to prioritize being a foodie. And I'm always shocked when someone says, hey, if you go to New York, be sure you go to the so-and-so deli. They have the greatest so-and-so. How do you even remember the meal you ate at a place five years ago? That just shows you how obsessed people are with their taste buds instead of their health. Yeah, for sure. Well, let me, let me just, because we haven't specifically talked about it. So you said your food is most people would consider boring. My, my diet is basically steak and eggs, and most people think that's boring, but it doesn't bore me at all. I look forward to it. In fact, I've got I got two steaks and, and a dozen eggs waiting for me in about an hour and a half. I'm going to have that, and that's going to be a yeah. you know big meal. But what do you what do you eat? What's a day to day sort of a typical week or day look like for you? Well, um, I eat a lot of vegetables, um, and when I say a lot of vegetables, I don't necessarily mean a lot of calories from vegetables because, as you know, right. They have a lot of bulk. Right, sure. Right. So I could eat vegetables three or four times a day, and I still haven't exceeded more than probably 800, 900 calories from those vegetables. Right. So um, a typical meal for me now, because I'm trying to get as lean as possible, is a protein source, mm -hmm. a low glycemic carbohydrate source, and guacamole. <laughs> guacamole. That's my fat source right now. So I'm very, very, very low in fat. I'm trying to go into a calorie deficit as much as possible. The best way to do a calorie deficit is by reducing your dietary fat because it has the greatest amount of calories per gram. Um, and so, and I'm trying to maintain enough protein so that I can maintain my muscle and, and, and not be hungry. So I'll eat, you know, 
10 egg whites, I'll eat, you know, a half a pound of fish, I'll eat, you know, a quarter pound of chicken and vegetables and oatmeal and then, you know, guacamole. But if I wasn't doing this, I would be eating coconut oil, ghee, whole eggs, uh, prime rib. Um, you know, I, 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 I've learned to not be afraid of saturated or unsaturated fats. Um, and I maintain my relative leanness in the off season just by not eating starches. Yeah. What do you, I mean, you're going to, you're going to come into the contest 185. So what are you walking around at six months from now when you're not competing or what's it, what's, you know, at, at the oh, height an of average, your... an average off season weight for me is about, I would say between one. 95 and 205. Yeah. So now you don't have to cut that much. And you, know, you see these guys are dropping 40, 50 pounds before a contest. They swallow up to 290 and they come in at 230 or whatever it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I've, I've never, I've never liked the feeling of, of, of eating that much food. I mean, I've, we've all heard stories of people trying to eat 10,000 calories a mm -hmm. day. And I almost question, you know, whether that's even honest. I mean, that's a lot of stuff to put in your gut. Um, and you have to digest it, what, in three, four hours? And it's got to be out of there before you bring the next pound of food in. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I also don't like the way I, I, I look and feel when I'm heavier than 205. I don't like that round face look. I don't like the bloated look at all. Yeah, yeah and, and that comes with metabolic consequences when you're bloated and probably some inflammation. Do you have much in the way of, you know, you mentioned your back, you had herniated disc, but how, how do your joints generally do with all this training you've been doing over the years? Oh, I'm hundred percent fine now. I mean, I, you know, obviously I herniated a disc at some point. Most, and most people, by the way, are walking around with a yeah, herniated sure, disc right now. They don't know it. Right. Yeah. And they won't know it until that thing starts to push against the nerve, but it's, it's fairly easy to herniate a disc. And, and, you know, if you put a barbell on your back, that is, let's say, 200 pounds. Okay, that's not very consequential. But once you start getting into a 400, 500, 600 pound compression, you know, can it tolerate that compression? Maybe. One wrong move, though, you know, one move to the side with that amount of compression, and it's going to pop out uh, an intervertebral disc. Um, and, and so I don't know when it happened. Look, I was like every other bodybuilder. I was squatting. I was, you know, I never did a lot of deadlifts, but I, but I did a lot of the you know, the heavy lifting in the earlier years. Um, and, and then when you start doing the math, literally the math, <clears throat> and you realize, I mean, this is, this is a, a, an example of what I typically teach. This is uh, just to show you, there's these levers. <clears throat> Sorry to get a little off subject here, but these levers are both six inches long, right? So if I take a weight on each side, you can see this equals that. I can take a second one, put it over here. Two of those equals one of those at these angles. Three of these at this angle equals one of those at this angle. This is the angle of a barbell squat lower leg. Mm -hmm. This is the angle of a lower leg during a sissy squat. Yeah. You can get three times more load with a sissy squat than you can with a barbell squat by paying attention to that lower leg angle. So once I stopped doing that, you know, I stopped having any joint pains at all. And part of my book explains what is considered a normal, natural anatomical motion and what is not. Right. So once you start getting away from the unnatural anatomical motions and you stop using bad physics, you won't have any joint problems. You know, as far as uh, training, are you typically training by yourself at home? I mean, is that how you do it? And, and how many once a day type of thing? I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I was, I did a, an interview last night and I was talking about how COVID did us a favor because, you know, it caused us to find alternatives to going to a commercial gym. And so my buddy and I, we created this home gym and, and that's where we work out. And then when all the clubs opened up again, I just, we just stayed in this garage gym and um, he is now on vacation. So he's left me with the key and I go in there usually uh, 8 PM because it's cooled down by then. You know, we had that heat streak there for a while. And so working out during the day was very difficult. Um, and because I'm dieting and because I'm getting ready for this preparation, that becomes my sanctuary. Now it's 90 minutes. I'm there all by myself. It's very quiet. Um, I've never needed a partner to encourage me to train hard. I can do it fine by myself. 
Uh, I'm listening to the music that I will be using for my posing routine. Uh, it's a it's a three minute song which goes over and so you can figure out you know ninety minutes of three minutes looping. You know I'm knowing the song very well, and I go into a zone and so I do a set and depending on where the song is, I will start to move in the routine. I'll do practice part of the routine. I'll go back to the set and I might go back to the so I'm just in this zone where I'm creating choreography. And I'm working out intensely, 90 minutes. I'm taking all sorts of little notes. Day 31, day 30, day 29. I start time, end time, body weight. I record all of this stuff. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Good for you. I am in heaven <laughs> for, for someone who likes that sort of thing. <laughs> Let me, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, you're not scared of saturated fat as, you know, you spent decades doing a low fat thing. And, and I mean, there's actually research out there showing that that actually fat and particularly things like cholesterol, which we get from basically animal fat, animal source foods, is actually anabolic. It has, an, has a role. In, do you have any thoughts around that? I believe it. I've, I've read it and I've practiced it. Um, I, I'm not eating beef right now because, as I said, I'm just trying to go as low a fat as I right. possibly can. I'm even eating cod instead of salmon mm -hmm. because it's lower in fat. Right. So um, I, I, it's not the healthiest thing. It would be healthier for me to eat salmon and beef right now. And and one day a week, I do eat uh, all that stuff. I had a hamburger last Sunday. Uh, I'll eat lasagna on Sunday. I think it's important to replenish the things that you're depleting at least once a week when you're going through this kind of diet. Um, but if I wasn't doing a competition thing right now, I would be eating beef at least, you know, three times a week, four times a week, if not every day. Yeah, I can I can get behind that for sure. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, like, like some people point to, you know, you mentioned Bill Pearl and there's, you know, Casey Viator and all these other classic body. There's one guy named um, uh, Vince Geronda, Geronda. Uh, he was a big advocate of a low carb, high fat approach with, with obviously periodic refeeds. Any thoughts on his style of, of approach? I, I know some bodybuilders were bought into that. I think uh, I'm trying to remember the first, uh, the first Mr. Olympian, I'm blanking on the name. Right oh, Larry there. Scott? Yeah, Larry Scott, right. Yeah, big, yeah, big yeah. Well, biceps guy. He was a guy. pupil of, of Vince Gironda, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, some people say that the things I recommend now in terms of exercise are the things that he recommended. Like he was an advocate of sissy squats and he was against barbell squats. Uh, uh, he was against barbell squats because he said it, it, it works the glutes too much. I would disagree with that. I would say it does work the glutes more than the quads, but it doesn't work the glutes as well as they could be worked and should be worked. <laughs> he was obviously against gluteal development, <laughs> but, um, and he was also against, let's say, working the obliques because he thought it would make your waist too big. I would say the external obliques, internal obliques have very little capacity for growth. Um, I mean, we see some people with thick obliques because that's their body type, but, um, I don't know much about Vince's teachings in terms of diet. You know, I didn't read that much about it along the way. I did read a lot about his exercise, exercise recommendations. Um, I frankly, I've never been guru minded. I never liked the idea of, of, uh, of listening to somebody's recommendations and saying, and they're a guru and so therefore they must be right. Um, I question everything. I, I don't care who says it. I always ask, does this make sense? Does that make sense? Um, and then I research it and then I experiment and then I come to my own conclusion. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the important part. Not only, you know, you look in the mirror and you can, you can test it on yourself and, you know, maybe it makes sense for someone in a different particular situation. But I think that's, that's a, you know, be very skeptical as, as I am. I, anything I tell people, test it out on yourself and see what results you get. Yeah. Doug, unfortunately, we're, we're coming to an end of the, this hour. And I, I, unfortunately, uh, that's all the time I have allotted for this. But tell me, tell folks uh, if they want to find out where your book is, uh, find out more information. I'm, I'm assuming you have some sort of social media presence, I'm guessing. Can you? Let yeah, us know I'm on Instagram. Think? I'm on Facebook. And my website is DougBrignoli.com. Okay. And if you want to get the book, you can get it at my website. And there's also, if you want to see my three way split workout, you know, live, in other words, it's me actually doing it. It's not like me doing like a, an explanation or demonstration. That's available on my website. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm starting to do a vlog now where I will document, you know, every day, um, day 31, day 29, day 28, my weight is this. Um, so people can see, I think people are curious about what is the journey for a bodybuilder, like physically and mentally, when he's dieting and approaching something that 
most people would say it's kind of scary to get on stage in front of hundreds of people or thousands of people and potentially make a fool of yourself. Um, uh, the transformation is also fascinating. You can go from looking like this to looking like that uh, by just moving these switches around, mostly dietary switches. Um, so that's all available on my website, and I've really enjoyed being on your show. What are you? What weight are you going to get down to? You said you're 181. I think you mentioned. Are you going to drop down to 175 and then swell back up to 185, or what's? Uh, you know, I don't. I doubt I'll get to 175 uh, because, and the reason I say that is because my weight has stayed somewhere between 186 and 183 um, for the last few weeks, and so I'm, my weight isn't plummeting. Um, I suspect there's a little bit of a trade. In other words, I'm losing some fat. I'm gaining a little bit of muscle. It's staying somewhere. Um, but frankly, I don't care. Uh, and nor, nor should anyone care. The idea of what's your goal weight is sort of ridiculous. It should be what's your goal look. Yeah. I look at the mirror and I decide whether or not I'm on track or not. If I'm not, I speed up, modify my diet. If I'm on track, I leave it alone. I just coast and I go at this rate of progress right now. I should be just fine. Um, but I anticipate guessing somewhere right around 181 or two would be my lowest weight I'll get to. Um, as I'm eating five times a day, um, but I'm, but as I said, it's very, very low in calorie, very low in fat and my workouts are in, intense. Um, and then I'll, I'll load back up again. Uh, and when I say load back up again, I don't mean carb load necessarily. Mm -hmm. I've discovered, I'm sure you have too, that your body kind of wigs out when you start to bring in donuts. Yeah. You know, I, I, I eat, you know, a hamburger. Yeah. You know, yes, some carbs, but I want some fat. Right. Yeah. I want some coconut oil. I want some almond butter. I want that's what brings me back. Yeah, I think it supports hormone production a little better. Is yeah, as well, exactly, so. exactly, and less disturbing to the insulin system and all that water retention and all the weird stuff that happens with that. What's the contest you're competing at again? What's the name of the contest? Um, I, I'm I'm exhibiting. Oh, exhibiting at okay. the AAU Mr. Universe competition, October twenty second. In Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Okay. Well, and then and then next year I'll compete in the WFF uh, 2023 Mister Universe, which will be in Mexico. Very good. Well, well, good luck with all that. Thanks for enlightening us, Doug. The best of luck to you. And I'm going to go find you on Instagram and give you a follow and, and learn something. So thanks so much. Thank Doug. you so much. I really appreciate having me on the show. All right. Appreciate it. Everybody, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.